morning, Triad. This morning, we're going to answer questions from our listeners that may sound like a question you've had on Social Security, trusts, Roth conversions, and long-term care, just to name a few. So, grab yourself another cup of coffee and join us for this morning's show. And welcome again to the Wealth Guardian Show. I'm your host, I'm Doug Ray, and I appreciate you spending a little portion of your weekend with us. Bryce is here with me in this studio. Bryce, how you doing, man? Staying alive, Doug. How are you? Staying on this side of the daisies. That's a good thing. Every day. Well, for those of you who are new to Ray Financial, the Wealth Guardians, it's a local independent firm, and we work with folks who are 7 to 10 years from retirement, as well as those who are already retired. And most people... They just don't know how to turn their retirement savings accounts into a steady flow of income once they aren't drawing that paycheck anymore. And I have focused my practice on retirement income planning. And, you know, history has shown that there's two powerful truths when it comes to finances in retirement. Number one, what got you to retirement will not necessarily get you through retirement. And number two, losses mean more than gains in retirement once you aren't drawing that paycheck. Two very good truths, Doug, and I want to remind everybody that we practice as fiduciaries, which means we are required to make recommendations that are in your best interest, not ours. And a reminder, not all advisors practice as fiduciaries, so keep an eye out for that. And like always, before we get started with today's show, I want to salute our military, our veterans, and our first responders. Thank you guys and gals for everything you do for us and your sacrifices. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. And so let's go ahead and get started here, Doug. Our first question for our questions of the month comes from Joan, and her question is this. My husband and I are needing to get some estate planning done, specifically our legal documents. I have heard many things about revocable living trust, but how do we determine whether we should get a revocable living trust or just a will? Help me out, please. Well, Joan, that is an excellent question, and, uh, you know, a lot of people now don't really even need the living trust anymore since the estate uh, uh, tax uh, exclusion has gone up as high as it is. It's over $11 million per couple and, you know, a, 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 per person, and the couple can combine it uh, to be nearly $23 million. Um, but they're very popular legal documents in the first place, and sometimes people do need them, and sometimes they don't. So let me give you some information to get you started down the right path. Now, I'm not an attorney, so I can't give you specific legal advice. But we do understand how these legal documents work. And one of the main reasons to take out a revocable living trust is to avoid probate. Probate involves providing the validity of a will and administering an estate according to that deceased person's objectives. And one of the problems with probate is it's expensive and it can take a while to get through. And that's when you lock up and tie down the assets before they're passed on. Now, you know, in North Carolina, probate is not necessarily all that expensive, but it is time consuming. And I'll give you a perfect example. My father-in-law passed away uh, last August, and uh, we still, uh, my wife is the executrix of of his estate, which, by the way, was not a huge estate um, by any stretch of the imagination. It's still not settled. Um, And hopefully in the next uh, two or three weeks, uh, it will. We're finally with the CPA getting his final tax return done. But here's another problem with um, with these things. Uh, it's public record. So anytime you probate a, a will, it's public record. And, and once things go through pro- probate, anybody can find out that uh, who you passed your assets to and, and what you passed on. So a lot of people like to avoid this. And that's what a revocable living trust does. It avoids the time delays, it avoids fees, and it just keeps things private. Now, not all assets go through probate. Many times people take out a revocable living trust when they don't need to because the assets that are going to pass onto their heirs avoid probate automatically. They don't need to pay for the expense of a revocable living trust and go through all the work entailed in getting it set up properly. So, with that said... Assets like 401ks, IRAs, life insurance, retirement plans, annuities, all pass via a beneficiary statement. When an asset passes through a beneficiary designation, it avoids probate, period. 
So you don't need a living trust to avoid probate in these types of assets. And many times, retirement savings plans like IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, life insurance, annuities are the main assets people have in their retirement years. All of that passes via the beneficiary statement and completely avoids probate. So if this is all you have, then you don't need a revocable living trust to avoid probate. If you have other assets, like a brokerage account, large savings accounts, properties, rental properties, land, all of that is probatable. So to avoid that probate expense, then maybe it would be advisable to look into a revocable living trust. Any attorney, any good estate planning attorney can give you advice on on your situation. Now, if you do take out a revocable trust, it's very important to understand that you need to make sure that you complete the revocable living trust and transfer your assets into the name of the trust. A lot of people go through the expense and the time of getting a revocable living trust, doing the documents, and then they don't transfer assets into it. The only way a revocable living trust will work is if you transfer the assets into the name of the trust. Many attorneys will help you do this, but then again, some don't. So you have to make sure that it gets done so that your revocable living trust works effectively. Good to know, Doug. Thank you. Well, Bryce, our next question, I'll throw this one to you, is from Marjorie, and she writes, a potential long-term care expense is a concern of ours. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to look into options to help protect our retirement plan. Good. What are the best options these days? Is it a regular long-term care insurance still available on the marketplace? Yeah, good question, Marjorie, and thank you for uh, reaching out to us. Um, Regular long-term care insurance or traditional long-term care insurance is still a viable option. It's still available through several companies out there. Um, But let me remind you and everybody else about how these plans work. You choose a protection amount that you'd like to have uh, for what length of time and whether or not you want inflation on it, and then you pay an annual premium for that policy. Then if you ever need long-term care, the policy will pay those benefits out to you for up to the length of whatever time you purchased. Now, the downside to traditional long-term care insurance is that it generally is pretty expensive, annual premium-wise. And if you don't ever need long-term care, then that money is gone because you're getting something out of it you need long-term care. It's, it's kind of like car insurance. You pay for it, you don't get in an accident, well, the money's gone. They don't give you your money back. So a lot of times, people don't like this idea because it's expensive and they can sink a lot of money into something that they're never going to end up using. But it's still a viable option for a lot of people. Now, other long-term care protection options are out there, and one of these is called asset-based long-term care. And what that is, that's a type of plan that you fund with a lump sum of money up front. For example, say you have $100,000. That $100,000 buys you a protection bucket of money, and it generally inflates pretty well on top of that. So let's say it grows to $300,000 of protection money. If you ever need long-term care, you're going to have $300,000 of long-term care protection money. The good thing about asset-based long-term care is if you never need the care, then the money that you put into it, in this case the $100,000, is going to pass on to beneficiaries or you get the majority of it back if you need it for something else. So it's kind of a win-win. This gets around the risk of paying for something that you may never need. And you get the benefits out of this type of plan no matter whether you need long-term care or you don't. Now, the money is going to come back to you or your heirs or pay for care one way or the other. And many times people really like the asset-based type of long-term care insurance because it gets around the risk and does buy a good amount of coverage. Uh, Also, some types of life insurance plans still available will allow you to use the death benefit for long-term care during your lifetime if you need it. It's it's similar to the asset-based long-term care insurance where you can use the death benefit for long-term care or as a death benefit. So there are other options out there for long-term care insurance. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. Long-term care protection is a very good idea because long-term care is not covered by Medicare or any other private insurance. 
So really, in, in the end, in summary, you, you want to find the right plan that is best suited for your individual situation. And if you need assistance with this or any additional information on these options, again, you can reach out to Doug and myself. Our phone number is 336 391 Three four zero nine. We'd love to hear from you and be able to help you out, uh, Doug. I'm now holding the next question from Ken. I'm going to throw this one back to you. All right, sounds good. And he writes, "My wife and I will be retiring in the next couple of years, and want to start making some tax moves to become more tax efficient. We want to start doing some Roth conversions, but how do we determine how much we should do each year?" Thank you, Ken. Well, Ken, I, again, that's another great question. This is on a lot of people's minds with a new tax code in place that went into effect January 1st, 2018. This new code essentially put tax brackets and tax rates at one of the lowest points in history. Many people are actually wanting to take advantage of this because they fear tax rates are going to be a lot higher in the future. They want to take advantage and start paying some tax now on money they have to pay taxes on at some point anyway and get that money moved over to a tax-free account like a Roth IRA. And one way to do this is called a Roth conversion, and that is what you're specifically asking about. Basically, there are three strategies for determining how much of a Roth conversion you should do every year. And the first strategy is to max out your current tax bracket. So if you're currently in the 12% bracket or the 22% tax bracket, whatever bracket you're currently in, and you expect in a best case scenario to be in that bracket for the rest of your life, then you want to take advantage of the room you have left in the bracket. For example, if your taxable income is $50,000, that puts you in the 12% bracket. That goes up to 79000 So you can take advantage of the room left in that bracket to do the Roth conversion. So $29,000. And that's called maxing your current bracket or bracket bump. And that's one strategy for doing Roth conversions, one of which we like quite a bit. So another strategy a lot of people use is looking for the amount they can afford to pay for it on their tax bill. Every time you do a Roth conversion, it generates a tax bill. You have to pay taxes on the amount to convert. It's something you want to do because the money you have to pay taxes anyway are choosing to do it now because you feel like taxes are going to be higher in the future, and I absolutely believe that's the case. You want to pay the tax with other money. You want to pay it out of savings or checking or something like that. In addition, depending on your age, you can also trigger a penalty. So if you have to be very careful about using money out of, con out of the conversion to pay tax if you want to pay the tax bill. Wow, Bryce, we're up against a break already. That segment went quick. Where did that go? Wow. You're listening to the Wealth Guardians Radio Show, and if you like what you're hearing, consider please liking us on the Wealth Guardians Radio Facebook page. And when we come back, we'll handle some questions on Social Security and retirement income topics. And welcome back to the Wealth Guardians Radio Show. This is where we help our clients retire the job, but not the paycheck. So for our listeners out there who are five to seven years from retirement and want to confirm that they are making the best decisions for retirement, we offer a no-cost, no-obligation second opinion to make sure that you are indeed on the right path. All you have to do is give us a call, 336-391-3409. Doug and I would be happy to meet with you and go over that with you. All right, Bryce. So uh, Vicki's got a good question for you. She says, uh, my husband and I are both 61. We're going to be retiring in three years. However, we're very concerned about the future of Social Security, and we feel we should turn it on for both of us as soon as we can at age 62 in order to start collecting our benefits before Social Security runs slap out of government money. Is there any reason we should not do this? Well, hi, Vicki. Thank you for sending in your question, and that is a good one and as well a common one. 
Now, before I answer it, I want to make our listeners aware that we have an upcoming workshop on everything Social Security. It's coming up June 11th and 13th at 6.30 p.m. in our Clemens office building. There is no cost or obligation to attend. However, you do need to give us a call and register. Again, you can call us at 336-391-3409. You can also find us on the interweb thing at www.thewealthguardians.com. So uh, maybe if you're interested, you'd like to attend that, give us a call. Uh, Vicki, now on to your question. A lot of people do have concerns about Social Security, and there are going to be changes to Social Security coming, and what will those changes be? There are a lot more people collecting Social Security Day than there used to be, and this puts a lot more stress and strain on the system, obviously. Now, whether or not you should turn your benefits on at age 62 to start collecting Social Security is something that Doug and I are not going to be able to answer today here on the radio because there are a lot of other factors that go into how you should turn Social Security on to maximize your benefits over your lifetime, and the strategy is going to be different for everyone. Now, it is not something you can determine just by looking at a couple of variables. You have to look at a lot of different things, such as taxation issues, longevity, your other incomes and assets, and that's just to name a few. I don't feel, personally, that Social Security is ever going to run out. They are going to make changes to the system to keep it solvent. But at your age, I don't feel a lot of those changes are going to affect you, quite honestly. I do feel... They are going to increase the early retirement age, so instead of being able to turn it on at age 62, that will probably go up to 63 or even 64 at some point. Also, they will probably increase the full benefit retirement age as well and probably increase Social Security taxes as some of these other changes that are possible. They will do all these things to help save the system before they start doing anything else because, again, these things will help fix the system and make it work for a longer period of time. So I don't believe you need to turn Social Security on at age 62 to collect due to a concern that the system is going to run out. Not going to happen. But, again, no one knows for sure, so that will certainly be your decision to make. Obviously, turning it on early is going to give you more money up front, but there is that break-even point, if you will, where that will come out behind waiting until at least your full retirement age or other ages. What I encourage you to do is sit down with an expert and go over all your options and look at all these things to determine the best way for you to do this. But if you turn it on early, and again, there are other factors involved here, you are probably going to get less over your lifetime. There's a lot of things to look at, but again, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to figure out what the best way is for your own individual situation, and we'll be happy to help you figure that out. Yeah, Bryce, and I, I want to let everybody know we'll be doing the Social Security workshop again. You know, we've been doing these workshops here in the triad for years now, and we've uh, we've helped a lot of people with their Social Security uh, benefits, uh, when to turn it on, how to maximize, and so forth. So, uh, again, like Bryce said, if you want to come to our workshop, it's coming up in a couple weeks in June. Um, give us a call at 336-391-3409, or you can actually register on our website now at www.thewealthguardians.com. And we both, Doug and myself, both are certified with the National Social Security Association, so we have had our training in this. We do know a little bit about what we're talking about here. Okay, uh, Doug, let's take the one from Sam here. He writes... My wife and I are in our mid-60s, and we will be retiring very soon. We will both have Social Security as well as a small pension. We have saved money in 401Ks as well as IRAs, Roth IRAs, and some brokerage and savings accounts. We have no idea at all on how to draw from all of these sources properly to meet our income objectives, and we cannot find any solid answers or expertise in this area. Our current advisor, who mainly offers investment advice, always dances around our questions about income and will not give us any advice or answers about these taxation issues. I did not realize there was such a lack of help available when it comes to actually knowing how to use your retirement plan. Please offer any advice you can. Thank you, Sam. Well, Sam, first off, I appreciate your honesty. And yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. You know, in retirement, dependable income is so important. And, you know, you guys are lucky in the fact you've got a small pension coming in. Nowadays, most people don't have any. 
So I'd like to say what got you to retirement may not get you through retirement. And when it comes to advice for income planning, there's a large lack of professional advice and understanding out there on how to do this planning properly. Now, as you said, most advisors help people with accumulating money and give investment advice and things of that nature. And that's very important in your working years, but as, you, as you're building your retirement nest egg. Now, I'm not knocking those advisors, but at some point, it's critical to make the transition from the accumulation of money to protecting your money so that it can become lifetime income. Very few understand how to draw from a nest egg properly once you get close to retirement and in retirement years be able to generate the income you need with the least amount of tax and have it set up so that that income is going to last you the rest of your life. Our firm and my credentials as a retirement income certified professional, we specialize in creating retirement income and Bryce and I would love to sit down with you and your wife. And we do a no cost, no obligation, we call it a second opinion, if you will, and show you in black and white how to create retirement income from your accounts. We do this every day. So I'm sure you can appreciate that everyone's situation is unique and different. We can't give you specific solutions on the show this morning, but we certainly can do this for you, and our process is pretty simple. All you do is make an appointment, we sit down and talk and learn the details of your situation, your accounts, and we create a written retirement income plan for you. So let me just kind of go over our process. Uh, it's kind of a, about a four-meeting process. Sometimes it runs more, sometimes less. But the first meeting is pretty simple. That's where we get to know each other. We ask you to bring in uh, your account statements, tax returns, those kinds of things. And we sit down and talk and try to find out what your goals, your needs, your objectives are. Our second meeting, you come back, and in this meeting, we're going to analyze the risk of your portfolio. We're going to take your own risk temperature, if you will, and see if the two of them are uh, compatible. Most of the time, they're not. By this time, we'll have looked at your statements, your accounts. We've analyzed all your fees, both the fees you know about and those hidden fees, and we outline those for you. We also do your Social Security optimization. That's where we show you how to maximize and squeeze out every nickel of Social Security benefits over your lifetime. So that's our second meeting. Then in our third meeting, we like to call this our our draft plan meeting. This is where we put it all together for you. We show you your written retirement roadmap up on a big 65-inch big screen. And we can play games. We can do all kinds of what ifs. We can say, what if you retire at 62? What if you wait till 70? What if you move to Florida? Anything you want to throw in there, we, we put it in the plan. And we fine tune it and custom fit to you. We also at this point show you what we would recommend for your accounts to be set up so that A, we can control the downside volatility. We want to build an account that's not going to lose more than 10% in a 2008 type collapse. And at the same time, we want to reduce the fees for you. And then we go over the pros and the cons of what we recommend. Then in our fourth meeting, that's when we bring it in together, we give you a written retirement book with tabs showing you everything you've seen up to date, and we go over the summary. And at that point, you can decide if you want to work with us or not. There's no obligation on your part. We do all this work for you for absolutely no charge. All right, Bryce, we've got time for one last question, and this one comes from a gentleman who wants to know if this new tax code we have is permanent. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, No, (laughs) the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that went into effect January 1st, 2018 is not permanent on the individual side. Now, on the corporate side, the cuts are permanent, while the individual changes expire at the end of, I think it's 2025. Is that right, Doug? That's correct, yes. All right, so most very smart, connected people firmly believe that at that point, tax rates will definitely go up and potentially go up quite a bit. Personally, I don't see any way that that will not happen. So, again, I'm looking at this next five to six years as a golden opportunity for many people to take advantage of this and become more tax efficient by making
making some smart, strategic tax moves in the meantime. There's a lot of different ways to do this besides just the Roth conversions that we were talking about earlier. It's a golden opportunity for many people to be able to do this because when this tax code does expire at the end of 2025, in all probability, tax rates will go up potentially, potentially dramatically at that time. Bryce, I think you just hit the cover off the ball with that statement. Folks, it's critically important for you to understand you have now until January 1st of 2026 to do some forward tax planning because taxes are likely to zoom after that. Think about it. They have been as high as 94 percent in this country and also 70 percent at one time for a long period of time. That gives precedent for taxes to go much higher than they are now. So let's talk about this. Let's start cleaning those forever taxed accounts up and take advantage of these 12 and 22 percent brackets where 10 or 15 years from now they may be 50 percent brackets. All right, Doug, you know, uh, it's like you mentioned, everybody's situation is unique, and that's why we like to sit down for that no cost, no obligation, second opinion and review that you had talked about earlier. Folks, we help see if we can identify areas where we can offer additional options, more tax efficiency, social security optimization. Let us show you how to retire the job, yet keep the paycheck. I also want to remind listeners of our upcoming Social Security workshop that Doug talked about. It's on June 11th and 13th. Just attend one of them. Call 336-391-3409 to register or visit us online at thewealthguardians.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll be here again next week on the Wealth Guardians Radio Show. Doug, you have a good rest of your weekend. And you too, Bryce. All right. Everybody else, take care, and you have a good rest of the weekend as well. 